extend to the state before we proceed further in this matter. No, there is. Very well. You may be seated. Is there any issue the defense needs to raise moving into next week? No, Your Honor. Then let's go ahead and address Mr. Marcus's motion to quash the defense subpoena. Mr. Marcus, good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. Nice to see you. You as well. I have reviewed your pleading. What is the defense's position concerning the trial testimony subpoena? Judge, the defense doesn't seek to elicit any testimony related to Mr. Marcus's attorney-client protected conversations with his client. There are three categories that the state seeks, or the defense seeks Mr. Marcus's testimony. The first is the state syndicated and they reaffirmed to Your Honor that they intend to ask Investigator Isom whether or not Mr. Marcus called immediately after Katie McManowa was arrested. The jury, if left there, the jury takes away that someone or somehow the defendants are all in cahoots, if you will. The defense believes that Mr. Marcus would testify that that is not the case at all and he would provide information as to how it was that he received information about Ms. McManowa's arrest and how he knew to call Investigator Isom. That's the first category. The second one is the state has investigated vigorously to try to pinpoint that the Adelson family has provided legal fees for other lawyers or other co-defendants in the case. I don't know whether the state seeks to elicit testimony of that nature, but as recent as January of this year, the FBI was down in Miami speaking with Mr. Marcus about such things. Mr. Marcus provides an explanation that doesn't involve attorney-client privilege. That didn't happen. Mr. Marcus made a suggestion of the potential legal strategies involved, but nothing ever came to fruition and there were no discussions with any co-defendants or the Adelsons. And then the third category, Judge, is there's a text message between Mr. Marcus and his client, Charlie Adelson at the time, about him having seen or bumped into Katie McManowa outside of his office and there's a comment about something to the extent of it being a coincidence, but there was no conversation that was had. Again, if the state elicits that testimony in all three of those categories and it's left hanging, it goes unanswered. But in each circumstance, Mr. Marcus is able to respond and I don't believe that it invades the attorney-client privilege. Mr. Marcus, I'll allow you to respond to what the defense is proffering and why they would seek your testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. So I'll take the easiest one first, which is the last one. I had not heard about this text message between me and my former client, but that would obviously be privileged. So any testimony regarding a text message between me and Charlie Adelson, I would not be able to comment on. So that, I think, is the easiest one. Let me take the other two. Let me ask you one question before you continue. Mr. Adelson has not waived any privilege with regard to you. Correct. You may continue. Thank you. Yes, I have not been informed that he's waived any privilege by him or anyone else. The other two categories, and I'm sorry for not looking always at the camera, looking at my notes here, Your Honor, but the first is the call to Detective Isom. So I guess I just don't understand how the state putting in this evidence is relevant, and therefore the underlying evidence in my response to it, I think, should be suppressed. The idea that on the morning that Katie McVanagle was arrested, I learned of that arrest and called the detective to find out if Charlie Adelson was being arrested. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what any good lawyer would do. The defense is right that I would respond to any nefarious suggestion by the state that there's nothing wrong with me calling the detective to find out if Charlie was being arrested that morning. But I guess my response would be I don't think that initial evidence should be able to come in that I made a phone call to the detective to inquire about Charlie. Certainly that had nothing to do with Donna Adelson, and even if this was a trial about Charlie Adelson, I don't think it would be relevant, Your Honor. I was trying to find out whether the detective that morning was going to arrest Charlie. Nothing's wrong, nothing untoward or abnormal about me calling the detective to inquire about that. So I would ask that 
that whole little snippet be excluded, the underlying evidence and what my response would be to it. The final thing about legal fees, I addressed this in my motion. I, I've spoken to the state about it, so I don't think they're going to elicit anything about this. They've released me from my subpoena uh, on this issue, so I'm not sure that the defense needs me to rebut anything because my understanding from speaking to the state is they don't intend to elicit anything. Ms. Kappelman, Ms. Dugan, are you seeking to elicit any information or evidence during the trial that would concern Mr. Marcus? Potentially, yes, Your Honor. We are seeking to introduce the evidence that I mentioned previously at our last hearing about the call to ISIM. And the relevance hook of this would be it goes to your conspiracy theory or what exactly? Yes, sir. Exactly. Um, would I get into anything about the offer from Mr. Marcus to Catherine McBanwell's attorneys to pay her attorney's fees on behalf of the Adelsons? Potentially, yes. Um, and what's the third question? I believe the last uh, matter well, was I'm any sorry. text message between Mr. Marcus and Charles Adelson when he was representing him. Yeah, I think that the defense has mischaracterized that evidence, but that is a piece that could potentially be inquired about as well. All right. As to the first issue of the phone call and whether it goes in any form or fashion to the conspiracy, what I'm going to rule is the following. The state may inquire as to the topic if the defense has a factual relate, related line of questioning to ask Mr. Marcus, the factual line of questioning will be permitted. Nothing that goes into attorney-client privilege may be inquired to. Is everyone clear on this? Yes. Very well. As to the second line of questioning, Again, Ms. Kappelman, this is being offered for what exactly concerning any possible agreement or payment? Yes, same, same relevance argument here on it that it goes to conspiracy, the existence of the conspiracy. Right, as to this, were the defendants, well, I believe the privilege argument gets a little more thorny at this point. What exactly can Mr. Marcus offer that would not be privileged on this issue? You, are you inquiring to me, Judge? Either party. My understanding, and Mr. Marcus can correct me where I'm wrong, is that there was a conversation with Katie McManus's counsel. I don't believe that Mr. Marcus conferred with his client but it's something that he does in his normal practices, which a lot of lawyers do, myself included, call co-defendants counsel if there's a necessity of sharing expenses. I think it was his suggestion and just that, his suggestion versus the Adelson's. Marcus, is there any argument as to why this is privileged specifically? No, Your Honor, I just, if I'm asked the privilege question on the stand, of course, I'll just invoke it at that point. Um, I have no problem doing that, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, if I, if I could just be heard for one second. Go ahead. There is, a, there is a, of course, a difference with the state arguing the existence of a conspiracy and crazy conspiracy theories. There is no basis to argue the existence of a conspiracy by my calling the detective to find out whether Charlie Adelson was being arrested that morning. There, there's just no, they, they have to at least allege some tie some basis in fact to argue that there was a conspiracy that would have some relevance in this trial yard. I was calling to find out from the detective whether he was arresting my client that morning. There, there's no, there's nothing tied to any conspiracy, certainly um, with Donna Adelson. So they're, they're just, it's just a conspiracy theory with no basis in fact, Your Honor. I fully understand where you're coming from with both your pleading and your position this morning. As a factual issue, did the phone call take place? There is nothing protected concerning that. How that fits into the larger narrative of what may be admissible or not, yet to be determined, the state, um, they have their fair opportunity to put on their case. If further objection needs to be raised at that time, 
I will address at the time, but as to the pure factual issue and whether or not you have knowledge on that topic that does not go to privilege, that is where they will be permitted to inquire, that is where the defense will be permitted to rebut. Nothing more, nothing further. As to the second issue of the offering of fees, is there any privilege that you can assert concerning this, or this was just an idea between you to the other attorneys? The latter. As to that topic, factually, it may be inquired into how this again fits into the larger weaving of the evidence. If there needs to be an objection at that time, it may be raised, but on the pure factual issue, state may inquire, defense may rebut. As to the third issue of the text message between attorney and Mr. Mark, or excuse me, Mr. Tur Mr. Marcus and Mr. Adelson. I have my facts wrong on that, Judge. I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, the message is actually, Mr. Marcus spoke with Mr. Adelson. Mr. Adelson then communicated with his mother that he had spoken with Mr. Marcus, and Mr. Marcus had indicated that he had bumped in to Ms. McManaman. So I have my sequence of events a little off. And the state would be seeking to offer this also under the same conspiracy theory. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Mr. Marcus, are you alleging or asserting at this point that a privileged matter was discussed through that text message? I don't know what text message they're referring to, Your Honor. I have not seen it. But if they're referring at all to a text message between me and my client, of course that would be privileged. If, if I'm hearing Mr. Morris right, he's, he's now referring to a text message between Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson. I, I don't know whether that would be privileged or not. I, I doubt it, but I don't have any. That's not between me and my client and my former client. Was this a communication that was captured through the wiretap? No, sir. It's part of uh, what was captured off of the devices that were searched. So this was a text message from Mr. Adelson to Mrs. Adelson. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. As to that, Mr. Marcus, if it does not include any advice or opinions that you're providing to your client, if there was no joint defense agreement concerning them, ultimately this can be argued as a communication between co-conspirators. It just merely mentions your name, if I'm understanding this correctly. Is there any correction as that needs to be given on this point? Okay. No, Your Honor. Very well. As to that, the state may inquire as to the communication, as to anything that Mr. Marcus discussed with Mr. Adelson that may not be inquired into, but the substance of the text message, if the state in some way is going to argue this goes to conspiracy, they'll be given an opportunity to do so. If an objection needs to be raised, you may do so contemporaneously during the trial itself. So Mr. Marcus has a better opportunity to plan. Uh, the parties know when he would actually need to testify. I'm sure he has a very busy schedule and we're not trying to create a hardship or inconvenience as it relates to his work and business. As soon as the state rests, the defense intends on calling him. Right, I believe your previous estimate, Ms. Kappelman, was six or seven days. Yes, sir. Let's pinpoint on the calendar then at least a projection that will assist the witness in determining when he would need to be present. Jury selection begins next week on the 17th. And if we have a jury by Thursday the 19th, the first day of trial would be Friday the 20th. And that means by Friday the 27th, potentially the state is resting its case, which would lead us then to Monday the 30th, the beginning of the defense case. Unless I'm off of my calculations. You're correct, Your Honor. You're correct. And the defense has a bit of a time pressure also because of the Jewish holidays. Mr. Marcus, if you can go ahead then and mark on your calendar as to when you may potentially be called starting with September 30th. If there is any hardship that you need to address in other cases or matters that you're involved with, 
please let the parties know. Uh, if I, it's another state court matter, perhaps I can pick up the phone, free you up. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I am doing federal court on the first, but I'll work with the parties uh, to see if I can get called on the 30th, if, if it's actually going to happen. I, I suspect, Your Honor, that when the factual issues come up in trial, that, that you know, there will be some debate about whether these items should come in, because, again, I just... I'm not as plugged in as everybody here, but it just seems uh, that th the three topics don't go to any actual uh, uh, conspiracy theory, but um, I'm hoping that uh, when the objections are raised, uh, they may obviate my need to come on the 30th. All right. That concludes the motion to quash the subpoena. Have a good day, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, let's continue next with the continuation of the motion on the summary. Is Sergeant Corbett present? You should be judging me. Oh, and also, so the record is clear on this matter, the motion to quash the trial subpoena is denied as to all factual issues in which Mr. Marcus would have personal knowledge and can testify relevantly. Um, we do have a, oh, thank you. We do have another part of the motion. If you want, we could take up in the meantime. Which sure. Was, they had objections to specific parts of the presentation as to hearsay and attorney-client joint defense privilege. Um, we could go ahead and take those up now. Okay. Go ahead. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. The judge, it, it's changing the, 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 the document, so it's based on what I have so far. So there may be more that comes up in trial, um, but based on what I have right now. You've reviewed it all, you, correct? What's that? You've reviewed all of it. Correct? I've reviewed all that we have as of now. Um, all right, go ahead. So uh, page, I think it's page 20. It's an email between um, Donna Adelson and Renee Griggs. Um, and below it, it's in response to an email from Renee Griggs to Donna Adelson. Um, it's, it's hearsay. What is this being offered for? Judge, um, in that email, the, um, the defendant explains that she is stressed about her daughter not being able to relocate, you know, that her daughter, I think, doesn't realize how much it will affect her life, um, Don Adelson's life, their whole family's life, if this doesn't happen. Um, the, con the, the comments from the um, counselor um, that are concerned about her stress levels, I think, just add context. That's what we would be asking for the, the whole email to be admissible for. And so you're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted, or you're offering it as a party opponent admission of We're some sort? Yes, we're offering Donna Adelson's comments as admission by a party opponent, also a statement against interest about how stressed she is about her daughter not being able to relocate and how much it will affect her family if it doesn't happen. The therapist, or the, not therapist, life coach's comments that are also contained in the email would only be there for contacts. Very well, as to that point, Ms. Rauschbaum, I will permit slide 20 if there is any limiting instruction that you wish to give concerning Mrs. Griggs responses as only providing context to what the admission may be that would be appropriate but if these are party opponent admissions uh, they are permitted. Judge may I briefly just respond to be heard? Go ahead. The, the problem isn't uh, Donna Adelson's comments. We don't have a problem with that. Those are statements against interest. And they're not confusing at all. They say exactly what they just said. The problem is Renee Griggs's email to Donna Adelson, which is hearsay. It doesn't give any additional context to what she says. 
You can understand her. You can understand Donna Adelson's admissions by her email alone. So you're saying part then of this is just a response from Griggs to your client? No, the 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 there it's a it's a chain, right? So it's a chain of emails between the two of them. We have no issues with Donna's part of the chain coming in. The problem is Renee Griggs's chain doesn't. It, it's not confusing what Donna is saying. She's, I mean, I can read it to you. She says exactly what they just said. So if you never heard, if you never heard what Grig, what Grig says, she says, I'm stressed about my son, but honestly, I'm more stressed about Wendy and what will happen if she doesn't get relocation at the June hearing. Her life will change drastically if she has to remain in Tallahassee, and so will ours, and not in a good way. But I'll tell you more about it when we talk. Hope your mother is doing better or at least stable, Donna. So if you just allow that in, which we don't have an objection to, that's a statement that Donna Adelson's making, you're okay. But her, All right. Does but, Griggs respond from there? Does your Griggs, client respond from the response? No, Griggs doesn't respond from there, but Griggs' email below is, you know, hi, Donna, I'm not sure, and I only have part of it, but I'm not sure if you're back from your trip yet or not. I had planned to check in yesterday. However, my mom was in the hospital, and I was handling family stuff, so I was a bit out of pocket. More than anything else, I want to see how you're doing. It seems as though you have a great deal of weight on your shoulders. I could both hear and feel it on our phone conversation the other day. I'd really like to be able to help you shed whatever it is that feels so heavy. Please know I'm, looking, I'm thinking of you and looking forward to our work together whenever you're ready. Take good care, Renee. I, I don't see how that isn't blatant hearsay without any exception. It doesn't, you, you understand what, what, I mean, again, the relevance that they just put it in for is exactly what Donna Adelson's email says, which we don't, we don't have a problem with that piece of it. Ms. Dugan, what exactly context is being provided by Mrs. Griggs' first email before Ms. Adelson responds? So the defense, I think, accidentally, when they, when they read about, yes, I'm stressed about my son and my daughter, she doesn't get relocation, and how all our lives will change drastically, that was Donna Adelson's email. The last email he read was from Ms. Griggs. In that email from Ms. Griggs, who's the life coach, she basically is just saying, I'm checking in on you. You seem last time to have a great deal of weight on your shoulders. I'd like to help you. And that's when Donna Adelson talks about how stressed she is and how much their lives will change drastically. So I think that the, the life coach's email just gives Ms. Adelson's comments a little bit of context as far as explaining why she's kind of pouring her heart out there and explaining why she was, she's been so upset. How much further does this chain go beyond? I'm not seeking anything more than this page. I think there is more of this chain, but this is the only page I'd be asking for. I'll reserve ruling on this for now. I'll look at it again when I have my thumb drive and can review the slide in its entirety. Go ahead. Judge, I think the next item we have, I think we've got new slides on this, but I'll go, I think for, for ease, we'll go on the slides that you have because uh, it's the same issue. Um, if you go, it's slides 255, we don't actually have new slides on this, I apologize. It's slide 255 where Agent Corbett is estimating how long travel takes. Um, we, we're moving to exclude that based on speculation. Stugan, did Sergeant Corbett do any calculation or in some other way uh, develop this information that can be demonstrated as reliable? Uh, yes, sir. So on this slide, we have actual versus optimal travel of Wendy Adelson on the day of the crime. The actual travel is based on the events in her call detail records where it shows the cell towers that her phone is communicating with um, as she leaves her house and goes on her way that day from um, by the crime scene to ABC liquor store and up to lunch. That's based on call detail records. Um, and also other evidence like an ABC receipt um, that she had that day. For the red dotted line, 
that's the summary of the shortest route. So we're saying this is the actual route versus the shortest route she could have taken from point A to point B, her home to where another liquor store is in the restaurant. Um, what he uses to show travel time or miles is a, um, is a company called, or a mapping company called Esri, which is, and if you need to hear more about it from uh, Sergeant Corbett, he'll be here in just a second. Um, but basically that is um, a software that Florida Department of Transportation uses for their mapping and mileage calculations. He uses this very regularly in all of his mapping and travel calculations and all of his presentations. And he knows it's reliable because several times he's tested it himself. He looks at where the map says the travel time should be in the miles and he does the drive himself. Um, so he's been able to personally test this several times and it's been accurate. Um, and what we have in this slide is one is call records, the other is the summary of the shortest route. And it's literally just saying, hey, this is point A, this is point B, and this is the mileage according to Esri, and this is the minutes it should take. And it's twice as long as the actual, or, or twice as short as the actual route. All right. The sergeant also will be able to testify as to his knowledge of this program, its use, and the fact that he is qualified to use this program. Yes, sir, and I can ask him those questions today if you'd like me to, but he, he regularly uses this program and has knowledge of it, um, is qualified to talk about it, and has had personal knowledge of testing its accuracy before. All right. Well, on this issue, Mr. Rauschbaum, you're essentially objecting that either the sergeant does not have an accurate calculation or in some way misuses the program. What exactly are you getting at? May I have one moment, Your Honor? Go ahead. Judge, the objection isn't as to his knowledge, uh, and you know what, we're, we'll, we'll withdraw the objection. Very well. Rather Let's cross move on. on it. Judge, the next one, and let me just confer with Mr., with my co-counsel for one second. Go ahead. Judge, the next one is uh, page 318. Some messages between Charlie Adelson and Donna Adelson. Charlie Adelson's messages are hearsay and they don't meet, they're not in furtherance of a conspiracy. Response, state. Yes, sir. I could, if I could just give you the date of the messages, too. The, Go ahead. the date is um, August 2nd, 2016, um, which is after the arrest of Secreto Garcia and Luis Rivera. Stugan. In the motion, defense also objected to this on the basis of joint defense privilege. Is that no longer being argued? It's not that. We're, we're the, the, the document we objected to on behalf of um, joint defense privilege is a, hold on, let me just double check, is a different one, and we're going to withdraw that objection and given the court's ruling earlier today. Okay. This, this doesn't have to do with that because it doesn't mention this Mr. Marcus. This is just hearsay. Okay. This is just hearsay. All right, so um, Judge, on page 318, what we have are co-conspirator statements. This text message is, it says, this is from August of 2016, so this is going to be after the arrest of Garcia and Rivera. Um, it says, from Charlie Adelson to Donna Adelson, did you see in the paper where the state star witness that rented the hotel room is a convicted cocaine dealer Maybe those guys were just up in Tallahassee buying drugs. 
and just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe the Coke dealer did it because Danny didn't pay for his drugs just like he stiffed everybody else he did business with. This whole thing is just crazy. Then Donna Adelson goes on to say, I, I didn't see which paper. Charlie Adelson says, Tallahassee Democrat. Miss Adelson says, wow, I stopped reading everything. Charlie Adelson says, the guy admitted to selling them cocaine and hanging out with them. And Donna Adelson says, OMG, exclamation point. Our argument would be that this is co-conspirator statements. This is nothing more than co-conspirators celebrating another possible explanation that does not involve them for this crime. They are theorizing about another possible explanation for Dan Martell's murder, and this is showing just their theorizing and celebration of something that doesn't involve them that could explain the murder. Any response? I, I, I just don't understand it. I mean, it, it, it is, I mean, I can show you the text messages in its entirety if you would like me to bring it up, but that's not what's happening here. And I, I don't I'll, even... I'll review it with my thumb drive as well when I go through the slide deck. Um, the problem, Ms. Dugan, that I'm drawing with this, the communications do not have to be so overt as to saying, you know, we're hiding the gun here or something of that nature. But them essentially mocking, I guess, the drug dealer or the fact that someone else has been arrested in furtherance of their conspiracy. I guess flesh that one out for me a little bit more. Well, also, I mean, their defense <laughs> is that they were extorted. And this message pushes back on that. At the time this text was sent, Garcia... Don't speak over each other. Garcia and Rivera had been arrested already. So Donna and Charlie Adelson would have known the people behind Dan Martell's murder. And now those people are behind bars. And now, so why, if they've been extorted by these people for the past several years, why are they theorizing about another possible explanation for this murder? They know what happened to him. Those people have been extorting them for years, and they're arrested. Why are they now trying to say, maybe he was killed by a cocaine dealer for stiffing him? Why are they theorizing and celebrating something that doesn't involve him? All right, so I follow your logic. You're not offering this for the truth of the matter asserted, but rather to rebut any theory of the defense is planning to present about a extortion conspiracy of some sort. Right. Yeah, I'm not I'm not push I'm not offering it to show that the state star witness was a cocaine dealer. Maybe maybe Dan Martell was killed by a cocaine dealer or that's what Charlie Adelson actually thought. It's to push back on extortion. As to the basis of which it's being offered, Mr. Rauschbaum, what is your argument? The key is you gotta look and I'm happy to hand it up to you. You have to look at what Donna Adelson says. She doesn't say any of that. She, she's asking what paper, and I don't know what you're talking about. So it's Charlie Adelson's statements after the conspiracy, the alleged conspiracy, after the arrest, after the murder, and Donna Adelson doesn't respond in any way to what he's saying. She doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. All right, as to this slide, I'm going to reserve for now. I cannot ask you to show your defense or what you plan to argue, but ultimately, if any way, if it comes down to your client was relying on the statements of Charlie Adelson in some way concerning her behaviors and how she conducted herself and whether she in fact knew of the extortion, if the state plans to rebut the extortion theory of the defense, it is permissible as to that basis, but not for the truth of the matter asserted. If a limiting instruction needs to be given, it will be given as to that specific slide. You may continue. The next one, Your Honor, I don't have a page number. Let me see if I can figure it out. I think it's 321. It's very small um, writing, and it involves text messages between Donna Adelson and Wendy Adelson um, after, after um, Charlie Adelson's conviction. Again, the, the text messages by Donna Adelson are fair game.
but the text messages by Wendy Adelson are hearsay. And they, it, 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 the timing of it is critical. It's after the it's it's after the verdict. It's actually the hours after the verdict in Charlie Edelson's case. So I'm not sure how it could be in furtherance of a conspiracy. Stay. So I think that I, and we may be able to come to an agreement on this, I think that I'm going to, there's obviously, there's several messages between Wendy Adelson and Donna Adelson in this <coughs> chain. I would only be, I would only be using from when Donna Adelson says, prayer hands, you shouldn't have to pray, he's telling the truth, he protected his little sister from years, to the, your, your brother protected you for years, now you're not guilty. I wouldn't be offering anything after that. Uh, so I think the only thing Wendy Adelson says in the meantime is, I love you, call me if you can. If that's all, then we're okay with that. How about that? Let's move on. Okay. The next one is page 324. So we can come to an agreement on this one too. We're on a roll here. So you're not using do, do we need me any further? <laughs> Call it a day? I'm not going to use that one in the presentation. Okay. I tried to give them all the things that I could possibly use and have to try to whittle it down some. Just to be clear, that's the cell bright with the website pages? I will be using the website page for the non-extradition countries, but not the emotion. Okay, we're good. That, that's, that's all I have for now, Your Honor. Very well. On this issue. As the slide 20, I will review the entire email chain and then make a ruling on it. Is Sergeant Corbett here? Yes, he is. You can go ahead and step down so we can take the bits. Sergeant, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you will give today will be the truth? I do. You may take your seat. Thank you, sir. Ms. Dugan, I will allow you to inquire. Uh, the only thing that I would ask is that you hit the points that essentially were at issue in the last hearing. If there's other examination you have for the sergeant, you certainly may get into that as well. Okay. You may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. All right, um, Sergeant Corbett, can you tell us your name, spell it for the record? Certainly, it's Christopher Corbett, and that's C-O-R-B-I-T-T. -T. Okay, I know you've provided testimony a lot of times in this court, but just for the record, can you tell us where you work and what you do there? Certainly, I'm a sergeant with the City of Tallahassee Police Department, and I supervise the Technical Operations Unit. Okay, and uh, I don't, we're not going to be asking you for any opinions today, I don't believe, but just for the record, have you been qualified as an expert previously in the field of historical communication records analysis? I have, yes. And about how many times? Uh, 118. Thank you. All right, so I want to go through a few different things that we see in your summary quickly, or types of things. One is going to be call detail record summaries. The next is going to be the plotting of location. The next is going to be, I want to touch on your route, something that came up earlier today. And the next is going to be emails and texts. Um, for summaries, in this case, did we receive phone records for um, Wendy Adelson, Charlie Adelson, Donna Adelson, Harvey Adelson, Sufredo Garcia, Catherine Ray Vanwell, and Louis Rivera? 
Yes. And did all of those phone records come from each party's respective carrier or phone company? They did, yes. Were each of them uh, accompanied by a certification of business records? They were, yes. Are the phone records in this case voluminous? Yes. I mean, about how many pages are we talking about? Or just, I mean, hundreds, thousands, something like that, ballpark. Uh, ballpark is in the thousands. Uh, just one uh, set of records for uh, Charlie Adelson is uh, 4,400 pages, PDF pages. There's probably around 190,000 records that if you put to pages, approximately maybe 8,000, um, and that's, I think, on the low side. In the summary that you prepared for the state and a copy was, has been given to the defense, which is the same copy that you were deposed on a couple of weeks ago, in your summary, were you able to narrow the party's communication events by focusing on what law enforcement sees as significant days in the planning and execution of this murder? Yes, I was. Now, in the presentation, do we see call detail record summaries of communication between the parties? You do, yes. All right, I'm, I'm going to mark this as states one. I've shown it to defense counsel. This is just an, ex is this an example of one of the slides that shows the call detail record summary. Yes, it is. Okay. And if I could publish to the court. Thank you. Is there any objection to this exhibit? No, Your Honor. It is admitted as a part of this motion hearing. Thank you. All right, so. In your presentation, do we see several call detail record summaries, just as we saw in Exhibit 1, throughout the presentation for the party's communication on significant days in the murder? Yes. All right. Is Exhibit 1 an image of how those look? Yes. Is that how they look, though, when you get them from raw records from the phone company? No. What do you do to... Um, make them easier to read and put them in that format. How do you how do you do that? Uh, first and foremost is uh, assembling all of them together into one database or one um, pool of information. We will assign names or subscribers to the numbers so that we can recognize um, which party is speaking with which party. We have to evaluate each of the events to determine if they are valid communication events or if there may be routing events or voicemail events, and those may or may not be included. We would remove duplicate events um, in a summary like that. If, if two parties or um, two subjects are speaking to one another, we would have both of those events. Um, from one party's record, it would be outbound. The others would be inbound. So we would eliminate um, one side of that so that we could show that it was one communication between the parties um, and then it would be <coughs> assembled in something that's much re uh, much easier to understand and read, which is the format that, um, that you had in your exhibit. After each one of those call summaries in the presentation, or after most of them rather, are there, are there slides that show photos of the parties with arrows depicting the communication and then showing who communicated with who, the time that that happened, and the, the amount of time they spent on a call. Yes. Okay, and what I'm going to show you, or what I'm showing you, I'll, I'll label as States 2, um, is States 2 uh, how those, an example of how those uh, I guess like a, a, a chart of the phone communication looks in the summary. Yes. All right, at this time I move, move states two into evidence. Any objection? No objection. States two is admitted at this and time. May I publish to the court at this time? You may. Now this chart with the heads that, that has the data about the communications are all of those charts that appear in the summary, are all of those based on the data that we see in States Exhibit 1, the call summary? So are they based on the call summaries for each of those specific charts? They are based primarily on call summaries. Some of those would also include uh, maybe text messages um, from a, another source, an iCloud return or a Celebrate report. There may be calendar entries and things like that, primarily from the call detail summaries. Okay meaning that that's going to track the communication, whether it be a text or an email, that occurred between the parties. That's correct. And then you're saying that some of the charts with the heads and the 
arrows when it contains the content of a text, that that content would be from um, a Cellbrite report? It could be, yes. Okay. Um, regardless of whether it was from a Cellbrite or from the call detail records, is all of that communication in those charts from voluminous records, whether it be from a Cellbrite or from a call detail record from a phone company? Yes. Um, for some of the communication events, I'm now going to move on to the location data. For some of the communication events in the call detail records that you told us about are these voluminous records from the cell phone companies. Were you able to determine location data for some of those events? Yes. All right. And um, I know you've given the court uh, explanations in the past of, of how you do that. Judge, do we need to talk through that today? Just briefly, so okay. it's part of the record for the motion here. Thank you. Would you give us a brief summary of, of how you do that? How I determine locations? From, a, from call detail records, yes. <clears throat> so the call detail records themselves will generally contain, for most events, the location information in the form of the cell site or cell tower that the handset is communicating with for that particular event. From that, either directly in the records or from another key or uh, cell site database, we would uh, be able to determine the location of that cell site, where it physically is, plot that on a map, and uh, then start to make some determinations about location. Um, generally, historical cell site analysis is about inclusion and exclusion, um, given locations, places, times, and ask if a handset um, could be consistent with being at that location based on the cell site that it's communicating with or inconsistent with that location. The, uh, in addition to the cell site, we're also generally provided a side or a sector of a cell site. Most of our cell sites are broken down into multiple sides, and so that helps us kind of further narrow down where a handset may or may not be. How does your specialized training allow you to determine the location of a handset or the distance from a cell site of a handset that a layperson might not be able to? Uh, there's obviously a significant amount that goes into that. Um, first and foremost, locating the cell site, determining the accurate sector or side, determining the width of that sector or side, how many degrees or how far across on a clock, so to speak, that sector might cover. Evaluating adjacent cell sites or nearby cell sites to determine what the appropriate um, effective coverage area of that cell site may be. Taking into consideration topography, buildings, bodies of water, other things that may affect um, that, um, that radio signal. And then, again, ultimately determining if, um, if I believe that a handset could have been at a particular location at a particular time. When you determine, or when you are able to determine location of handsets, do you plot the cell sites on a map showing the cell sites, the time that the phone was communicating with that cell site, and the sector that they were communicating with? Yes. Sometimes we don't need to be as granular as the sector, and so sometimes we only plot the cell site itself. That may be um, good enough for the, for the um, point, or there are times, yes, that we will indicate the sector as well. Okay. And do we see those maps throughout your uh, summary? You do, yes. All right. Do you use other things besides just call detail records to help you determine the location of a handset or who may be operating a handset at the time of a certain communication? Yes. Okay. In this case, um, did, did you use, um, let's start with, are there some examples of text in this case? between the parties that helped you form an opinion on a party's location? Yes. Okay. Are some of those examples, if Charlie McVanwan and Catherine, I'm, I'm sorry, Charlie Adelson and Catherine McVanwan are making plans to meet up, and do you help, or do you look to that text message to help you determine their location when you then look at the call records and maybe see evidence of, of a meet up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Or if you see a text message that says outside your house, can that help you determine a party's location when you're looking at the call detail records to see if their location is also consistent with being outside the person's house? Yes. Um, 
In the summary, we also have, in addition to text that have location data, we also have traffic tickets, car rental agreements, GPS pings of a rental car, premier gym uh, still shot from footage, bank records of Rivera showing a picture of him at an ATM. Um, I guess for some of those, I guess like a bank record, could that be part of a voluminous record as well? Yes. Some of those arguably not part of a voluminous record, like a traffic ticket or a um, rental car agreement. Would you agree with that? Sure. Okay. Um, why were those included, though, in your presentation, all those things that I just named, in addition to the text with location? Uh, again, the cell site analysis is about locations and times. So, um, for instance, the rental car agreement um, for the first rental car provides a location and a time. It's an address of the rental agency and a time that the car was rented. So this allows me to take that location and time and compare to the call detail records. I can look at the locations of the involved parties to determine who was present, who, um, who drove to the rental car location, who did not. Um, the citation afterwards, um, the location of the citation tells me that uh, Mr. Garcia was in a different location than Ms. Magbanawa because we don't have Mr. Garcia's cell site locations in that time frame. So the location of the traffic ticket helps me understand that after the rental, he went somewhere different than she did. Helps me understand that at the time of the rental, where other parties were, Mr. Rivera was still at his home, Mr. Adelson was nowhere near. Um, <clears throat> So we can determine again who was present because that rental agreement gives me that location and time to compare records to. It's also the, the type of event. So it's a you know picking up of a rental car. And so as we look at the call detail records and who may be communicating with who in that time frame, understanding generally how car rentals are conducted, um, knowing that Mr. Rivera uh, or Mr. Garcia ends up with the vehicle, Ms. McManawa takes him out there. It's presumable that they're both in the car together heading to that event. So I don't expect really to see communications between them. Nor I might not expect to see communications between Ms. McManawa and Mr. Adelson because she would be in the company of Mr. Garcia. And then I know the date and time that the rental actually happened and I would from that deduce when they separated. And then I start to see communications from Ms. McManawa to Mr. Adelson. Because now, again, based on how a rental car generally happens, she has dropped him off, he has the vehicle, and now she will be by herself in the car and free to communicate. So all of that together goes into the analysis, if, if that helps. Okay. Does the documents that you just spoke about, along with the other car rental agreement and, tra and traffic ticket, GPS ping, the Premier Gym footage, the ATM picture, do those documents help you determine cell phone location and help you form your opinion on where the cell phones are and who was using them and put the communication around them in contact? Yes, they're all locations and times that I can compare the records to. It's a validation of the records themselves. When I see someone in a picture or a video, I expect that their handset locations would be consistent with that. And if they're not, then there was an issue. Um, in this case, they are consistent, so that's a validation of the records themselves, um, and it, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I was briefly going to touch on the routes, but now I'm remembering that that objection was withdrawn. Is the court requiring any um, questioning on, on the software he uses to route? Okay. Thank you. You may lay any record, though, you think is necessary. Okay. At this point, I don't think any is necessary, but if it comes up later, we can. Um, emails, emails and texts are the next things I wanted to touch on. In your presentation, are there several emails involving statements by Donna Adelson? Yes. Were all of the emails provided by Google, which is the company that Wendy Adelson and Donna Adelson use to service their email? Yes. Um, does that contain a business record certification? It does, yes. Now, why were... Uh, the emails included in this presentation? Uh, they were included to illustrate the content um, and as far as potential motive or um, events that were occurring at particular times okay. during the investigation. Do the ones that were chosen involve Donna Adelson's interest in the custody battle or motive in this case? Yes. 
Are the amount of emails in this case from Google voluminous? They are, yes. About how many emails would you say that there are? Um, Wendy Adelson's account has over, I believe, 87,000. Um, Donna Adelson's account is over, I believe, 57,000 individual emails. Okay. And I'm just looking for a ballpark here. In your draft of your presentation, the one, the same one you were deposed on, about how many emails did we send to defenses emails that we may, these are of interest to us and we may use in your presentation? Uh, tw no more than 25. Okay. Um, since then, have we been able to kind of whittle those down to uh, a smaller number? Yes, we have. Maybe five or five to ten? Uh, definitely less than ten, I think five or six. Okay. But despite how many we use in our presentation, are all of those from voluminous records? They are, yes. As far as, we also have several text messages in your presentation that don't have anything to do with location. Earlier I asked you about texts that had to do with location. Um, like, let's go to your house tonight or outside your house, things like that. Are there several texts in your presentation that are from Charlie Adelson's iCloud or the cell rights from the phones seized in this case that don't have anything to do with location? Yes. All right, not gonna go through them all, but do some that, that are gonna be included in your summary, does some involve Donna Adelson's interest in um, Wendy Adelson's custody battle and venting to Charlie Adelson about that? Yes. Are there some that push back on a possible extortion defense? Yes. Are the total amount of texts that we have in this case from Charlie Adelson's iCloud or from all of the parties' cell rights, are those voluminous? They are, yes. About how, I mean, ballpark how many? Um, I, I believe from uh, Ms. Adelson's phone, there's over 10,000 WhatsApp chats, 20-some thousand instant messages. Um, Charlie Adelson's iCloud account is, I believe, well over 280,000 messages, another, um, another probably 10 or 20,000 text messages. They're kind of categorized separately, so we're, we're in the hundreds of thousands of messages. Okay. And thank you for clarifying that. So when I say text message, I'm, I mean any message communication as far as text, instant message, or WhatsApp. So thanks for uh, clarifying that. Um, and so that we've gone from, I mean, and how, how many would you say we've included in your presentation um, to show the jury at this point? Um, I haven't counted them. There, there may be less than 20 chats with, um, you know, maybe, I, I would probably say less than 50 actual messages, but again, I have not tallied those up. All right. But from tens of thousands to less than 50? Yes. Okay. And those are all um, speaking to specific issues in this case? Correct. Okay. Those are all my questions I have for him, Judge. Um, if you wanted to, I can address any specific slide or document that you feel I didn't ask enough about that you need more of a record on? Okay, thank no, you. Ms. Rashbaum, do you have an examination for the witness? Very, very briefly, Your Honor. So, good morning. Good morning. So, you testified that with regards to these detailed summaries, there's thousands and thousands of pages, right? That's correct. But on the days that you're using, so in other words, I think Ms. Dugan showed you Exhibit 2, where you're doing the arrows. On those days, if you look at the call summary, it's less than five pages, right? It's mostly two pages on most of those days. For those days, the summary that you have may be a page or two pages. It took a significantly greater number of pages to get down to those one or two because, again, if there's five or six subjects in that one summary, well, that's five or six subjects worth of records. And their records for a, you know, a three-day, five-day period may be 20 pages each. So there's 100 pages to work down to get to just the unique communications um, that, that populate that that one or two that's in the summary. So let, let's get a little granular, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So you have one of those days is July 18, 2014. Yes, sir. Okay, and you do a summary of that day. If you took all your call records of that day, would it surprise you? All of them. If you took the call records for Charlie Edelson, everyone you got, mm -hmm. would it surprise you that it's under, under 15 pages? For one day to be under 15 pages, it would not surprise me. Right. Well, I'm, 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 I'm telling you it's, it's under 12 pages. Okay. Did that surprise you? No. Okay, so no. That's, that's not that voluminous, right? But that's 12 pages to get down to one. Right. I, I, I get it, but I'm saying if you're putting in a document, in other words, if I use the emails as an example, or the text messages, Ms. Dugan brings up that there's 20,000 text messages, or tw actually 12,776 text messages. You can take my word for that. Uh, you're only using, though, let's say eight text messages. I don't know what you're using, but let's say it's eight. How long are those eight text messages that you're using? They're less than a page, right, each? They could be, yes. Okay. The emails that you're using, you've got what, however number of emails you're using there. Wendy Adelson's email account had hundreds of thousands of emails, I, I, I presume. Right? Yes. Okay, but each email that you're actually putting into evidence, do you know what the longest email is of the ones that you're putting into evidence in? Uh, it would depend on how you format to print, probably not more than four to six pages. Yeah, it's, it's six pages, right? So the actual piece of evidence that's going to go back to the jury, which is the actual email, not the 100,000 irrelevant emails that no one cares about, but the actual document that's going to go back to the jury is six pages long, right? I would agree with that, yes. Right? So, so we're talking about... And, and Ms. Dugan uses the word summaries, but these, these aren't summaries, right? These are just taking pieces of evidence that are already going to be in evidence and sticking it into a PowerPoint presentation, which is a, a way of persuading, right? A demonstrative, not a summary. I would object to argumentative. Sustained. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. Um, with the location data that you're talking about, um, just... Centering on Donna Adelson, and I, I don't know if you have your, your records up there, so I'll just show you a page. Okay, and we can, we can mark this as Defense Exhibit 1 for purposes of this hearing. This is page 271 of my version of your, I'm sure it's changed. Just, you'll know this. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Judge, may I approach? May okay. So your expertise in doing this page, am I right that what you're basically doing is you're taking Donna Adelson's call record, you're seeing when there's an event, you're looking at what location on the call record the event hits, you're then going to a map that AT&T provides you, because it's AT&T in this case, you're then looking what the longitude and latitude is on that map, and then you're just plugging it on that piece of paper, right? That is part of what I do, yes. On that piece of paper, is that what you did? Do you need to say that, Sergeant? No, I don't. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, to start that, I have to go through, and, and this is combined. This is Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson's records. So it's two sets of records. So I go through the records to find the relevant time frame, and there's three data sets for each, um, each set of records. There's voice calls, there's data sessions, and there's text messages. So I isolate out each of those three data sets for the two sets of records, and then I have to evaluate those records for what I consider to be valid location information. And so a number of records are eliminated based on my understanding and knowledge of AT&T records. A lot of those locations are eliminated so that I have valid locations to plot. So from that, each of the locations in the records have to be verified against a records key or some other database for me to make sure that the information provided in the records is accurate. And then that is plotted onto a map. And then from that, some estimation or determination about where the handset was during those events can be made. Okay. Let, let, let's. Let's try to simplify that. I know you like to make it a little bit more complicated than it is. But 
when you say you eliminate events, you eliminate them, for instance, when it says zero seconds, correct? Um, zero seconds could be a factor. Right. Why else do you eliminate? What duplicates, right? It, it, in location information, the duration may play into the validity of data sessions. In particular, with these records at that particular time, not all the locations contained in the data sessions are uh, accurate at the time. So I have to go in and evaluate each one of those to make sure that they are the correct, loca or, you know, usable locations for that. And I, I guess I'm not the one to to determine how much expertise that takes, but it, it I, I believe that it certainly requires it. Well, on that piece of paper, which is all Donna Adelson's, everyone that relates to Donna Adelson looks like that. Okay. So on that piece of paper. Would it surprise you that all you needed to do for that piece that of paper? That would object to relevance to what would surprise them. Just, uh, okay. Please, ref please read I'll, your I'll question. rephrase it. On that piece of paper, you can see those times directly on either Harvey Adelson or Donna Adelson's chart. You see a call or a text message. Yes. You go and you look at what time it is, right? It says it, it says 8.15 next to the call. Correct. And then to the right of it, it gives you a longitude and latitude. It does. For each of these. And then you take an AT&T map and you plug in that longitude and latitude, which is what you did, right? Well, I don't take an AT&T map. I take the mapping software that we use, the Esri mapping. Fair enough. You plug in that longitude and latitude and it spits out a point to put a dot on a map, right? It does. And so. Even though it can be difficult, I'm not saying that there aren't examples that are difficult. In the ones that you're doing for Donna Adelson, it's on these pages. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as looking at the data, plotting it in, and doing dots. Again, I, I don't know that I'm the one to, to quantify what is simple or difficult. But I will tell you that if you took her records and you plotted every event, in that time frame, you would be plotting some incorrect locations. So it at least requires the recognition of, of, of valid locations at, at the very minimum. So tell me, on that piece of paper, what events were invalid that you got rid of? Because I don't think there were any invalid on that piece of paper. I don't think there are any other cell site data that showed up. I think those are the only ones that showed up. In that sequence, that yeah. travel sequence in those Tell period you eliminated. time, there are a number of data sessions, um, and I would have to be looking at the records themselves, that are continuous data sessions. And so they show locations, um, particularly for Mr. Adelson's uh, cell phone, as I recall, of data sessions that originated at his office. And those data sessions continue to show the original location, even though the times increase. And so you're, it, you're talking about Charles Adelson? I'm talking about Harvey Adelson. It showed him at his office on that day? It did, yes. On July 18th? As I recall. That are you sure I don't, about that? I don't want to say office. There are, if I can look at the records, there are data sessions that originated earlier in the day that continue to show the original location. Okay. Let me ask you a more simple question. On the actual exhibit that you're using, which starts at 815, I think, it plots, I think, four locations. On those four locations, were there anything that you had to eliminate in between those four data points? I don't recall specifically. I could look at the records and tell you, but I do not recall if there were other things. Well, in do you that have time. the records in front of you? I, I have my laptop. I could pull them up. It will take a minute. But sure. Go ahead. getting his computer out, did the court, my memory serves me, it seems like this line of questioning is Mr. Rashbaum's trying to inquire into his level of expertise and why does it require an expert to do this type of work. Did the, did the court already, I believe the court already ruled at our last hearing that he would be able to test, testify as an expert, form an opinion as to locations of cell phones, all of the things we would be offering him for in that purpose. That um, ruling was made. Um, 
Ultimately, is this going to an opinion that he is not permitted to give in some way, Mr. Rushbaum? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show that there's no expertise in these particular documents. There might be in showing where Secreto Garcia's timepiece was, but that there is an expertise with regards to Donna Edelson's, and I'm going to show, going to, using this to show that the documents that he has chosen here, or that the state has chosen for him, that it's a demonstrative. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a summary exhibit as iterated under the Florida statutes. I'm, I'm, again, we're not arguing that the demonstrative can't be used, and we're not arguing that the underlying documents can't come in. We're arguing that his presentation is not a proper summary, but is rather a closing argument that shouldn't go back to the jury. As to that point, I'll permit it, but. Um... Let's not have a full cross-examination of the witness that goes beyond the issues as to the admission of the evidence. Fair enough, Your Honor. Sergeant Corbin, if it's difficult to pull up, we can move on to Not difficult. It will be a little time consuming again. Let, let's move on. I think we've made the point. Okay. Uh, Sergeant Corbett, these emails and these text messages uh, that you've pulled, how were they chosen? Did you choose them? Uh, I did not choose them, no. Okay. Who chose them for you? Uh, they were ultimately chosen by the state attorney's office. Okay. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Go ahead. I have no further questions. Any redirect examination for the sergeant? No, sir. You may step down, sir. Thanks, sir. In addition to the argument that was made at the previous hearing, does either party have any additional argument to offer before the court rules? Very briefly. Or did you want the... Wh whoever's ready. You go. You are the proponent, Ms. Dugan, so you get the first crack. All right, so we heard about several different types um, of items that are in the summary. The first is the summary of CDRs, an example of States 1. We heard that those are pulled from voluminous business records for certain periods of time. Um, then we saw the, the charts that are basically a visual depiction of that communication that's in a, um, but in a more digestible format for the jury. Um, it's based on data from those call detail records from the voluminous business records and also from voluminous records in the Cellbrite. The only thing in the um, chart that is from Cellbrites would be just be some charts have contents of text messages in there. Um, all the rest are going to be uh, calls back and forth with the time um, and the person making the call and the, the person receiving the call. Um, but all of that information is based on the data and we can't just give the jury all of these cell phone records and, and say even if a certain day is 16 pages across three sets of records and say, you know, good luck. That's why the summary rule allows us to pull this information, uh, put it together in a digestible format for the jury. Um, the second type are the maps with the cell site locations. You know, these are summaries of the party's locations at certain times that are also pulled from the voluminous cell phone records. The same records that the call detail record summaries and the charts with the, with the heads are pulled from. Other items like the premier surveillance footage, the tickets, the, um, the texts that, that talk about a person's location, the bank records, the car rental agreements, all of those things are in the summary because they help Sergeant Corbett form an opinion on who had the handset at the time and where that handset was located. Um, and they helped verify the call detail records themselves. Finally, we heard about emails and text messages. The emails are business records from Google. These are voluminous records. 
Um, they are being testified to by a sergeant who specializes in communication records. He has identified and verified these as being from these accounts. There are thousands of emails. Um, we have we found several emails, lots of emails that go to motive or go to the interest in the custody battle here. We're going to be using about a handful in the presentation. The same with the text. These are maybe 50 texts narrowed down from hundreds and thousands that show certain relevant issues from this case, whether it be pushback on extortion or, or other things. And these are all pulled, though, the emails and the texts, um, the texts that aren't location data is what I'm talking about. They're all pulled from voluminous records, and they're all a summary of evidence showing a relevant issue from those voluminous records. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Rashbaum. Judge, you've seen their summary. Their summary is a closing argument. It's not a summary. It's a demonstrative. Our ask here is not a big ask. They're, the underlying exhibits are going to go to the jury. They're not voluminous. The fact that there is a universe of text messages and they've chosen 10, 15, or 20 of them does not mean that they can make a summary of it. That, that's not how the rule works. They can put in the text messages, none of which, not one text message is voluminous in this case. Not one email is voluminous in this case. And by the way, the call records aren't voluminous because what they're going to put into evidence are they're going to put in the overall call records and then they can put in, if they want, a subset of the call records, for instance, July 18th. They can put in those call records. They're literally less than 12 pages. Now, we're not suggesting that Sergeant Corbett cannot have a demonstrative that illustrates the issue, but to allow a 320-page document or whatever it's going to turn out to be, which is purely argumentative, I mean, they're taking text messages and homes and cell locations, and they're all making their argument of what it means, is precisely what the court in Pete Incorporated v. Vanguard, 378 F. 3rd, 1154, cautioned against. When it said, because summaries are elevated under Rule 1006 and also Florida Statute 90.956, to the position of evidence, care must be taken to omit argumentative matter in their preparation, lest the jury believe that such matter is itself evidence of the assertion it makes. That's what they're doing here, Your Honor. They're putting a closing argument. They're trying to put his demonstrative as a summary exhibit of a closing argument to go back to the jury. That, that, that shouldn't be allowed. And so, Judge, we're not asking that a demonstrative not be used. We're not asking that the underlying documents don't come in, but we're asking that the exhibit be a demonstrative exhibit not gone, not, that does not go back to the jury. May I briefly respond, Judge? So, so briefly, it will <laughs> tickle my ears and we'll move on. Go ahead. There is no argument in, not, in any of these slides. This is all data and information from the records. Um, there's plenty of evidence in this case that is not in this presentation that would be in a closing uh, argument demonstrative. Um, this is not a closing argument demonstrative. Judge, may I briefly respond? Well, let me set my watch. <laughs> it's 11.02 and 32 seconds. By 11.03, you will be done. Argument is, argument is when you plot lines on a map, and then you take a text message, and you put it next to a house, and you put it all together. That's argument. That's using data to make an argument. That is the definition of argument. Within time. Thank, Thank you. you all right. As to the rulings on this matter, the court has previously ruled that Sergeant Corbett can be qualified to testify to the interpretation of historic communication data. The summary will be available to the state as a demonstrative in front of the jury. Also, in researching this matter, I came across a recent case of the third DCA dealing with summaries, which I believe has a relevant ruling to this matter. This is EJD Construction Contractors and Investment Corporation versus Preston, found at 306 Southern 3rd, 1053. And ultimately, the third DCA held when a summary is accurate and not misleading, it can be properly admitted during trial. 
The summary may also include opinions by the individual preparing the summary, as long as the opinion is based on the underlying evidence and data that is admissible. To that point, the court will permit a summary to be admitted to the jury. However, the summary may include a page cross-referencing all voluminous records or state exhibits that Sergeant Corbett used in forming his opinion, his method of analysis, and the conclusions that he reached, or any inferences which may be properly drawn from the evidence. The, ev the summary is not to include any cumulative repetition of admitted state exhibits, and this is specifically going to matters such as the emails, text messages, videos, things of that nature. Any inadmissible information or any opinion the witness is not qualified to give. This is going to cut down the pages that actually go back to the jury, but a summary that is based on the voluminous records and exhibits and the opinion that was reached by the sergeant that is proper and meets the definition of a summary pursuant to 90.956 will be permitted. Any additional objection that needs to be raised at the time it is offered, the defense may raise at that point. Do the parties need any clarification on the ruling? No, sir. And just so it's clear, as far as the call record summaries, and I believe the arrow charts, those will be permitted as far as being in the summary itself. The location maps, that will be permitted as well. But again, all of the other matters that are not voluminous themselves, such as any emails, text messages, or videos, it can be cross-referenced as to what the sergeant used, but it will not be a part of what is admitted. The demonstrative itself, though, can be used at, as the state would like to use it. Ultimately, for that, if there are any inadmissible items that still need to be ruled upon, I believe slide 20 is the only one outstanding. I will give you a ruling on that matter before it is to be used even as the demonstrative. There are no questions. We are finished at this time. I will see everyone on Tuesday morning at 8.30, and we will begin with the jury selection process. The process will be, as we did in the last trial, going through the same five questions dealing with pretrial publicity and any hardship. The parties will be permitted to examine the prospective jurors based on the court's questioning. Anything that we need to address before we finish? Nothing from the state. Judge, there is just one scheduling issue. Go ahead. Um, and look, maybe trial will go quicker. I'm hoping it does. But uh, based on what I'm seeing, uh, October 3rd is uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, the Jewish holiday. And uh, I just wanted to I see. I believe it. the court's closed on that day. Perfect. And I'll sit down now. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to make you work on a holiday, Mr. Rush, but <laughs> yes, ma'am. For Monday, let me go through that then based on the chart that I have with Lynn. If it's not related to this, then we're just going to finish up. We are in recess at this time. Have a good day, everyone.